Associate Director of External Affairs here at USCIS. My role in USCIS is to promote communication and engage with the public to ensure you have relevant updates from our agency. Two years ago today, on April 18, 2017, President Trump signed the Baja Executive Order. The purpose of this executive order is to protect the jobs and wages of U.S. workers. It also directs the agencies across the federal government to work together to advance policies to ensure that H-1B visas are awarded to the most skilled or highest paid beneficiaries. USCIS has announced and continues to work on a combination of rules, policy memorandum, and operational changes to implement this executive order. Our first speakers this afternoon are from USCIS and other government agencies who will discuss some of these initiatives to protect the economic interests of U.S. workers and to prevent fraud and abuse within the immigration system. During the listening session, we have also invited individuals from outside of government to participate as speakers during the engagement. We appreciate their willingness to participate today. Please note the, that the views expressed by the non-governmental speakers are their own personal views and not necessarily those of the administration or otherwise endorsed by the administration. Ensuring the integrity of the immigration benefit system is one of this administration's guiding principles as we strengthen employment-based visa programs and protect U.S. workers. I am joined here today by officials from USCIS, the Department of Labor, and the Department of Justice. During this listening session, we will also hear feedback from academics, legal practitioners, displaced U.S. workers, and industry leaders. Their input will enable USCIS to determine the effectiveness of its efforts to implement the Baja Executive Order. Before we begin, I have a few administrative reminders that I need to share with everybody. Um, I would like to remind all participants that this is a public meeting, but it is not for press purposes. Members of the media who may be joining us and need additional information on our discussion or have questions about other agency issues should call the USCIS Media Affairs Division at 202-272-1200. For those in the room, we ask that you focus your comments on topics related to today's engagement that you feel need additional guidance or clarity. Your opinions can help us determine areas that need further development or communication. We will listen to the feedback provided during the listening session. However, we will not respond immediately. Instead, we will take comments back for consideration. The session is being recorded. The purpose of today's engagement is to hear feedback from various members of the public to help USCIS determine the effectiveness of its efforts to implement the Baja Executive Order. While some of the feedback might pertain to ongoing rulemaking that directly or indirectly relate to this executive order, please note that comments specific to any of the open rulemaking should be submitted consistent with the instructions in the applicable Federal Register notice. Please also note that we will not be taking comments on any rulemakings for which the public comment period has ended. During this engagement, we will not be commenting on any of the open rulemakings or other matters that relate to ongoing litigation. With that out of the way, let's begin. Um, first, I have the pleasure to introduce L. Francis Cisna, Director of USCIS. Director Cisna was sworn in on October 8, 2017. From 2005 to 2017, he served in various capacities within the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Most recently, he served as the Director of Immigration Policy within the DHS Office of Policy. During this time, he was selected for a detail to the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee, where he worked on immigration-related legislation. Prior to his service at DHS headquarters, Director Cisna worked in the USCIS Office of Chief Counsel and as a private immigration attorney in Richmond, Virginia. Thank you so much, Director Cisna. Uh, next, we're pleased to have with us Mary Thomas, Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division with the Department of Justice. Ms. Thomas began 
for federal government service in June of 2017, when she was appointed the Director of Policy at the Department's Office of Justice Programs. Before her work at the Department, Ms. Thomas served in Florida Governor Rick Scott's General Counsel's Office, where, among other duties, she served as sole counsel for the Florida Cabinet and the Florida Defense Support Task Force. She also served as General Counsel at the Florida Department of Elder Affairs. Thank you for joining us today, Ms. Thomas. Now I would like to introduce Molly Conway, Acting Assistant Secretary for the Employment and Training Administration at the Department of Labor and the Deputy Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Labor. The Employment and Training Administration is the lead agency in the delivery of apprenticeships, the Job Corps program, and workforce development grants and programs. Ms. Conway worked for nearly a decade on Capitol Hill and brought her experience to the Department of Labor in early 2017 as a lead policy advisor. Also from the Department of Labor, I would like to introduce Keith Sonderling, who serves as both the Acting Administrator and Deputy Administrator of the Wage and Hour Division. Mr. Sonderling oversees the division that is responsible for administering and enforcing some of the nation's most comprehensive federal labor laws, including the Fair Labor Standards Act and the Family Medical Leave Act. Thank you both, Ms. Conway and Mr. Sonderling. Now I'd like to introduce Mike Hafer, Chief of the Office of Performance and Quality within USCIS, who will provide us with a data presentation. Mr. Hafer has a wealth of knowledge and experience with immigration data and analysis, data quality and standards, and population estimates. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Hafer. So now we'll turn it over um, to Director Cisna to start. Thank you, Catherine. Um, one clarification, did you, uh, did you say whether people could smoke or not? Did you say that, uh, I guess? This will be a non-smoking okay. event. There we go, all right. We will add that to the reminders. All right, just in case anyone thought they could light up. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with, uh, here with you today. Uh, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, all of them, uh, for joining us in today's listening session on the implementation of the Buy American and Hire American Executive Order. Two years ago today, President Trump signed and issued the Buy American and Hire American, or BAHA, Executive Order, which, among other things, seeks to create higher wages and employment rates for U.S. workers and to protect their economic interests by rigorously enforcing and administering our nation's immigration laws. Specifically, the president directed me and other agency heads to, quote, propose new rules and issue new guidance to supersede or revise previous rules and guidance, if appropriate, to protect the interests of U.S. workers in the administration of our immigration system, including through the prevention of fraud or abuse, close quote. As part of our efforts to fulfill the President's directive over the past two years, USCIS has instituted a series of reforms designed to protect U.S. workers. We have put together an accomplishments list that members of the audience can see on the screen, and those, and I think they were handed out in paper as well, uh, and those listening to today's engagement by phone can see on the USCIS website at uscis.gov. We will be here for quite some time if I discuss all of our efforts at length, so I plan to just briefly highlight a few of our top accomplishments so that we have time to hear from other speakers and members of the audience. Companies seeking employment-based uh, immigration benefits who circumvent our nation's immigration laws hurt the wages and job opportunities for U.S. workers. Pursuant to the President's directive in the Baja Executive Order, we have taken a number of steps to stop these abuses. First, we have sought to combat H-1B abuse at third-party work sites by issuing interpretive policy guidance related to petitions for H-1B workers who will work at third-party locations. Second, we have also released policy guidance that instructs our adjudicator to apply the same level of scrutiny to both initial petitions and extension requests for certain employment-based visa programs. By applying the same level of scrutiny to both the initial and the extension requests, 
We are hoping to ensure that our adjudicators are approving only those cases that meet all relevant statutory and regulatory requirements. You can see more about our work on the Baja webpage uh, on the Baja webpage on USCIS.gov and at the Unified Agenda at reginfo.gov. We have also strengthened fraud detection and prevention efforts for employment-based visa programs by creating tip lines for H-1B and H-2B programs, enhancing our site visit program, and sharing more information with our federal partners to combat immigration fraud. For example, as of March 31st, the H-1B tip line has received nearly 7,700 tips. Roughly 30% of these tips have resulted in leads that we can investigate. Similarly, we have received nearly 700 tips alleging H-2B abuse. Nearly 29% of these tips have resulted in leads. In 2017, we enhanced the targeted site visit program to focus resources where fraud and abuse of the H-1B program may be more likely to occur and determine whether H-1B dependent employers are evading their obligation to make a good faith effort to recruit U.S. workers. In fiscal year 2018, over 40% of H-1B and nearly 18% of L-1B, that's the intercompany transferee visa, targeted site visits resulted in fraud determinations. Over 40% of H-1B and nearly 18% of the L-1 that we did site visits on resulted in fraud determinations. Looking forward, we are planning to build on this program's, the targeted site visit program's success and ensure that employers and non-immigrant workers are complying with the terms of their visa classifications. Furthermore, Last year, USCIS and the Department of Justice signed a Memorandum of Understanding to expand collaboration to help deter, detect, and investigate discrimination against U.S. workers. We will hear from one of those Department of Justice experts on the successes of this MOU later today. We have already seen stories of successful investigations that have come out of this MOU and other interagency partnerships that we have, and I look forward to continuing our collaboration to stop employment-based immigration fraud and protect U.S. workers. Finally, we have increased transparency around the operation of employment-based visa programs. We continually seek to expand the data that we release to the public. Earlier this month, for example, we launched an H-1B employer data hub to provide information to the public on employers petitioning for H-1B workers. This new tool allows the public to see approval rates and denial rates, or approvals and denials for each H-1B petitioner and calculate the approval and denial rates from that data. We will be updating this tool quarterly and we will continue to expand the data that we make available through this tool. Uh, I, I will say that for many, many years that I have followed these uh, visa programs, I've long uh, wanted that sort of data to be made available. And at, at last, I'm in a position to be able to do it and we did it with Mike, Mike's excellent help. Um, for the first time, the public can now see also the countries of origin and the gender of H-1B workers. Uh, this was data that never came out before, and now that too is on our, on our website. In conclusion, we at USCIS are committed to carrying out the Baja Executive Order and lawfully administering our nation's immigration laws. We will continue to review all applicable operational guidance, and policies, and regulations to ensure that they protect U.S. workers to the, greatest, to the greatest extent possible and allowable by law. We will have much more to do to implement the Baja Executive Order, and I do look forward to hearing from all of you and my fellow panelists on our work to implement it. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, now we're going to turn it over to Mary Thomas, Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Department of Justice. Thank you so much, Director Cisna and Associate Director Rexrod. It's great to be here with all of you today on the second anniversary of President Trump's Buy American and Hire American Executive Order. I'd like to offer a special thanks to the members of public, the public that are here with us today in person and via phone. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy days to be here. We are truly appreciative of your time and look forward to your valuable insights. Since President Trump signed the Buy American and Hire American Executive Order in April 2017, the Department of Justice has worked closely 
with the Departments of Homeland Security, State, and Labor to implement the directive that federal agencies enforce immigration laws in a way that protects the wages and employment rates of U.S. workers. Consistent with this executive order, two years ago, the Civil Rights Division's Immigrant and Employee Rights Section launched the Protecting U.S. Workers Initiative. This initiative targets, investigates, and brings enforcement actions against companies that discriminate against U.S. workers in favor of temporary visa workers. This initiative is based on a law that prohibits discrimination in hiring, firing, and recruiting based on citizenship, immigration status, and national origin. The law prohibits employers from hiring temporary visa holders over qualified and available U.S. workers based on a discriminatory preference for visa workers. Over the last two years, the Civil Rights Division has secured hundreds of thousands of dollars in back pay and other relief for U.S. citizens and other U.S. workers who suffer citizenship status discrimination due to an employer's preference for temporary visa holders. For instance, in June 2018, the division entered into a settlement with a landscaping company. The division's investigation concluded that the company went through the motions of advertising over 450 landscape laborer vacancies in five states in a manner that misled U.S. workers about the available positions and prevented or deterred some from applying. Among other things, the company prematurely closed the online job application process for U.S. workers and did not consider several qualified U.S. workers who applied for positions during the recruitment period. Instead, the company asked for and hired H-2B visa workers, claiming that no U.S. workers were available. As part of the settlement, the company set aside $85,000 to compensate certain U.S. citizens and work-authorized non-U.S. citizens harmed by the company's practices. In a case that we settled in February of this year, the division's investigation found that an employer that accredits investment professionals prefer to hire H-1B visa holders over U.S. workers based upon citizenship status. The investigation concluded that from at least November 2016 through January 2018, the company set aside exam grading positions for temporary visa holders and failed to consider equally qualified U.S. workers. The agreement requires the company to pay more than $300,000 in civil penalties. The Protecting U.S. Workers Initiative isn't just about enforcement. It also involves building effective partnerships with other federal agencies. In the past two years, the Civil Rights Division has entered into three memoranda of understanding with other agencies to advance the goals of the Buy American and Hire American Executive Order. For instance, we have expanded our partnership with USCIS and entered into an MOU with the Fraud Detection and National Security Directorate last year. We similarly expanded our partnership with the Department of Labor through another MOU and entered into a new MOU with the Department of State. In addition to formalizing long-standing collaborations, these MOUs facilitate information sharing among the agencies and promote the exchange of complaints and referrals. Through our MOU with USCIS, we have received valuable information that helps us better target companies 
that may be discriminating against U.S. workers and allows us to broaden and fine-tune our investigation. These collaborations are critical because they enable agencies to share resources and tap all available tools to address fraud, abuse, and discrimination in the use of temporary visa programs. We are proud of these collaborations and the results we have achieved so far to stop discrimination against U.S. workers. We know, however, that much more work needs to be done, and we are eager to hear from you and learn about your experiences. Your input is crucial to informing the Department of Justice's work to address unlawful discrimination against U.S. workers. Thank you again for inviting the Department to be a part of today's listening session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, we will hear from Molly Conway, Acting Assistant Secretary, the Department of Labor. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cisna and Associate Director Rex Rhodes for the invitation to speak today. Um, companies that commit visa fraud and abuse hurt working Americans and American job creators who play by the rules. These companies cut costs by not providing legally required wages and working conditions, and in some instances, lives are at stake. The Department's Employment and Training Administration, through the Office of Foreign Labor Certification, is responsible for issuing labor certifications for the immigrant and non-immigrant employment-based visa programs within the Department's jurisdiction. As Acting Assistant Secretary for the Employment and Training Administration, my remarks will focus on the labor certification process, and my colleague, Acting Administrator Keith Sonderling of the Wage and Hour Division, will focus on the enforcement of these programs. In June 2017, Secretary Acosta directed the Department to protect American workers and guest workers by aggressively confronting non-immigrant visa program fraud and abuse. After undertaking a thorough review of the Department of Labor's role in the immigration system, the Secretary directed the Wage and Hour Division, the Employment and Training Administration, and the Solicitor's Office to aggressively and vigorously enforce all laws within their jurisdiction governing the administration and enforcement of these employment-based visa programs. As part of this directive, the Secretary also directed the agencies to make referrals of criminal fraud in these matters to the Office of Inspector General. Unlike enforcement under H-2A and H-2B temporary worker programs, the Department's investigative, investigative authority under the H-1B program is subject to considerable statutory constraints limiting the Department's ability to investigate employer compliance with the H-1B program requirements and to hold employers accountable. Statutorily, the Department is limited in its review of the labor condition application to, quote, completeness and obvious inaccuracies, end quote, and has only seven days to review an application, creating challenges for identifying systemic violations and fraud. The H-1B labor condition application is statutorily required prior to a foreign worker receiving an H-1B visa. The document serves as an employer's attestation that is offering the hire of the prevailing wage or actual wage paid to similarly employed workers. That working conditions will not adversely affect similarly employed workers and that the employers have notified these employed workers of their intent to hire foreign workers. To that end, in November 2018, the department finalized and implemented changes to the H-1B labor condition application and investigatory forms to better identify systemic violations and potential fraud and provide greater transparency to the public and to the program. First, the department is now collecting information regarding whether employers are placing H-1B workers with a secondary entity. Many of the abuses U.S. workers face from the H-1B program have stemmed from H-1B workers displacing U.S. workers at secondary entity sites, sometimes requiring the U.S. workers to train their foreign replacements. This is unacceptable. Previously, H-1B employers were not required to disclose the legal business name of any company with which an H-1B worker was placed. This made it difficult to ascertain which employers were actually using H-1B workers, hindering transparency for U.S. workers employed by that employer. As part of the new labor condition application, 
The department now requires companies that place workers with a secondary entity to list the business or company name, address, and wage rate paid to workers placed with that entity. Second, many employers who place workers with secondary entities are considered H-1B dependent employers. H-1B dependent employers are employers with at least 15% or more of their workforce comprised of H-1B workers, meaning their workforce is significantly H-1B workers. H-1B dependent employers are required by statute to make an additional attestation that they will not displace U.S. workers when they will not place and if they will not place H-1B workers at a secondary entity unless they ensure the secondary entity will not displace similarly employed U.S. workers. These employers also have certain recruitment requirements. Unfortunately, the manner in which the statute is written leaves a large loophole for U.S. worker protection. An H-1B dependent employer is exempt from, from, from fulfilling this non-displacement attestation and the recruitment requirements if they pay the H-1B worker at least $60,000 annually or the H-1B worker possesses a master's degree or higher. Accordingly, the department now requires an H-1B dependent employer to inform the department if they are employing an H-1B worker under an exemption and the exemption upon which they are relying whether it's $60,000 salary threshold or the degree requirement. If an applicant is relying upon the degree requirement, they must now provide a copy of the degree to the Department of Labor. The $60,000 annual floor is statutorily set, and any increases in that threshold would require congressional action. Prior to the Department updating the labor condition application, the statutory exemption used by H-1B dependent employers was not collected. Using data collected since the implementation of the updated form last fall, 99% of all H-1B dependent employers rely on the $60,000 threshold. It is the policy of the department to enforce vigorously all laws within its jurisdiction concerning the administration and enforcement of non-immigrant visa programs. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Keith Sonderling, the, um, at the Wage and Hour Division, the agency with, that enforces these non-immigrant visa programs. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for having oh, me here. Oh, sorry. I, I guess I shouldn't have done no, that. No, 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 no. Go right ahead. All right. We'll get right Now we'll hear from Keith Sutherland. <laughs> Thank you uh, for inviting me here today to participate in your listening session. As the Acting Administrator for the Wage and Hour Division, my comments will focus on the Department's enforcement of the worker protections for the H-1B, H-2A, and H-2B visa programs. In accordance with the President's Buy American, Hire American Executive Order, the Wage and Hour Division is strongly committed to using its existing authorities to vigorously enforce compliance with the H visa programs and ensure proper protections are in place for U.S. workers. The President's Order touches on the three temporary worker programs the Wage and Hour Division enforces. Within the Hire American Directive, the order calls on the Department to fully enforce the protections in the law governing temporary worker visas and, importantly, to prevent any abuses of these programs. As you heard, ETA administers the labor certification process to determine when foreign workers are needed. On the back end, the Wage and Hour Division is responsible for investigating employer compliance with their H program obligations. In June of 2017, the Department of Labor announced actions to increase protections of American workers while more aggressively confronting entities committing visa program fraud and abuse. To hurt bad actors that fraudulently take advantage of non-immigrant visa programs, hurt working Americans, and American job creators that play by the rules. These bad actors often cut costs by failing to provide living accommodations and pay at the standard they agree to provide. And at times, guest workers' lives are at stake. In, further, in furtherance of this initiative, Wage and Hour, ETA, and the Office of the Solicitor are coordinating the administration and enforcement activities of the visa programs and making referrals of criminal fraud to the Department's Inspector General. Since then, RIG has focused substantial investigative resources towards combating visa-related fraud schemes. The Department's efforts in this initiative has, has led to significant results, including convictions of attorneys, employers, recruiters, corrupt government employees, and labor brokers. The Department also continues to work with the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, and USCIS to further investigate and detect visa program fraud and abuse. The Departments are coordinating with one another to ensure that individuals, both American workers and H workers, who believe that they or others might be the victim of fraud or abuse receive their legal protections. 
To drive compliance with labor standards of these visa programs, Wage and Hour employs a multi-pronged approach balancing education and enforcement. The department believes that employers want to comply with the law. They just need the tools to know how. That is why the Wage and Hour Division remains committed to robust compliance assistance programs. We are constantly striving to improve, modernize, and simplify our educational compliance and assistance materials. For example, Wage and Hour recently published guidance to assist H-1B employers in the form of a field assistance bulletin. This bulletin reiterates employers' responsibilities under the H-1B visa program to notify affected U.S. workers of their intention to hire non-immigrant workers. On the enforcement side, Wage and Hour balances complaint-based investigations with agency-initiated investigations where complaints are not likely to be filed. A key component of the investigation is ensuring that employers recruit U.S. workers before applying for permission to employ temporary non-immigrant workers. As part of our agency-initiated work, Wage and Hour is currently conducting a nationwide initiative to strengthen compliance with heavy users of the H-2B program. This includes hotels and landscaping industry. If we find an employer committed a violation of one of the H worker programs, there are a number of actions Wage and Hour can take. Back wages, the most common remedy, are available when foreign or U.S. workers are properly paid or when U.S. workers were improperly not hired for the job. Wage and Hour can also issue civil money penalties, and in certain cases we can debar employers from using these programs. In fiscal year 2018 and through the second quarter of 2019, the department concluded more than 975 non-immigrant visa cases. The department recovered over $18.2 million in back wages on behalf of more than 9,000 employees and assessed over $6.1 million in civil money penalties. These findings demonstrate the Wage and Hour Division's commitment to using all its tools in conducting civil investigations to enforce fully the protections of the law governing the H visa programs and to prevent any abuses. In closing, the Wage and Hour Division is focused to safeguard American jobs, level a playing field for law-abiding employers, and protect guest workers from being paid less than they are legally owed. I look forward to hearing your comments on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Um, next, we will hear from Michael Haber, Chief of the Office of Performance and Quality here at USCIS. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as Director Cisna stated, uh, part of the Baja is to effort is to have more transparency in terms of data. And with more transparency, there might be more questions. So the H-1B data I'm going to be speaking to today uh, is I've been doing this for many years, and it is quite complex. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the uh, recent trends, talk about some of the data, and also highlight the uh, employer data hub. I think there's somebody behind the scenes that's moving this, but here we are, yes. So let me define what we're showing here. We're showing data on approvals for H-1B petitions. There's one person per petition from 2008 to 2017. The orangish bar uh, line at the bottom is initial employment. Initial employment is initial employment as an H-1B. That doesn't mean that the person didn't have working before, or it might be in the United States previously. That is generally capped, but that's why you see it's sort of a flat, flat line. So obviously, we just went through the H-1B season. You know that uh, we get many more requests, petitions, and that's limited. Um, where we see the growth is in the gray bar, which is showing continuing employment. And continuing employment, somebody who's already received that, but here, uh, it's more, a person to count it more than once. You notice what looks to be an increase in 2016, and I think that really is partly due to uh, some of you, I think you're very familiar with the Simeo decision, where people who uh, have uh, the conditions of their employment, like if they're working in another geographical location, had to apply, the petitioner had to apply again. So you're, you're seeing, you see a bump in the, those numbers. So... It, in this case, I don't think, uh, you know, we don't, we're not confident that this is showing that there's actually an increase in the number of people working as an H-1B, just that we're getting more petitions because of this decision. Um, 
I think that uh, you're probably many of you are very familiar with the uh, leading uh, it is dominated by Indians and the computer uh, natives of um, India in the uh, computer um, occupation of computer related and um, over this period for India it's increased they were 53 percent of the population um, and it's increased to 75 percent over that period uh, it's Mainly, mainly in the continuing employment categories, though. Uh, in the initial employment, they've gone from 55% to 63%. Recently, they're 80% of the continuing positions we received. Okay, next. Oh, I'll use the clicker, okay. Uh, this chart is showing compensation for initial and continuing uh, approvals. It's generally increasing over time. If you look at initial employment, increasing from a median of about 59,000 a year in 2009 to 75,000 in 2017. Continuing, the employment for continuing workers is higher, going from 70,000 in 2009 to 90,000. 2017. So we're seeing general increases over time. Big part? No, they're not constant dollars. Uh, this shows you initial employment, focusing on initial employment, looking at the occupation, uh, selected, selected years. Computer related is going from 60,000 to 76,000. Uh, you see engineering. So these are the top, the top occupations: 65,000, 81,000. Um, and you can see some of their administrative specializations. I had to look up what that. It's really accountants is what that's, what that's talking about. Most people are in accounting fields. I want to get into a little bit of uh, sort of the understanding the data. Um, as it turns out, I was, report, I was reporting on data on approvals, and that was we're reporting that towards the end of the year and it's at a point in time. Because what happens is that over time, many uh, are the people who are approved, they're later revoked. Uh, they're, you know, the terms of their employment change or the person doesn't. Uh, he leaves the company, and we can get up to 30, 40,000 re revocations in, in a particular year. So that makes it a little tricky to look at rates of approval rates and RFE rates. So the data, that this, these data, I should have mentioned, are all out on our site, on the, uh, on our, the Baja site. And this is showing requests for evidence. The first set of, uh, the first table shows requests for evidence rates by quarter from 2015 and 2019. And you can see this is up and down and up and down. And part of this is we have two streams, really. We have the initial cap, which comes in all in the first week of April. And uh, we decide those cases. And then there's some cases that are decided later. And what we generally see, there is a seasonal pattern to our RFE rates. Generally, the first quarter of a fiscal year are the highest. Um, and you can see in 2019, we are the highest, we have the highest ever. So there does appear an increase in the RFE rates, but I would say we will have to see what happens in that, in that second and third quarter as we go through that, because that's generally will go as we process these cases that came in right away in the, uh, under the cap. We'll be deciding those cases right away and probably would come down um, so we have to follow, we'll be publishing these at, at, by quarter. The last set of tables shows of those who got an RFE, what percent were approved. We see a slight decrease over time in the approval rates for those persons who do get an RFE. Okay. Um, also, Director Cisno mentioned the employer data hub. So 
want to show you what you can do uh, on this. Uh, it does distinguish between new or initial employment and continuing employment, which, as we've discussed, is pretty important. You can use that data to calculate approval and denial rates. You can even download all the data. So this is all of the approvals in a given year, and I think we've gone back 10 years. You can download the whole thing, or you can use the site itself. You can search by employer name, by state, city, zip code, or um, the, uh, the industry code, which is the next code that's listed here. But this is an example when you get to the search screen. In this case, we've selected the state of District Columbia, fiscal year 2018. And when you do that, what comes up is this result. And we, you, can, uh, you can see the leading, the leading petitioner, in this case, was Georgetown University. You can sort and by any of those columns that are listed up there. IA is initial approval. ID is initial denial. And it will show the last four digits of the tax ID. So a lot of information. And uh, it, it can be mined. And I, I think Professor here right here is one of the leading miners of these data. So uh, again, we're making the data more available. With transparency, might come some more questions. We've already received a few, and we're constantly trying to improve it. So, welcome to listen to your comments. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our presenters for their remarks. One quick reminder before we move on: we do have folks joining us by phone for this engagement. Um, and with that, we will move into the listening session portion. Um, I will start by introducing Associate Professor Ron Hira from Howard University's Department of Political Science. Professor Hira has written widely on offshoring, high-skilled immigration, innovation, employment relations, and the decline of the middle class. Professor Hira co-authored the book, Outsourcing America, and has testified numerous times before Congress about high-skilled immigration and offshoring and has been widely quoted in the media. So thank you, Professor Hira, for sharing your academic perspective. Thank you very much. Um, I've been researching the H-1B program and its impacts for uh, almost 20 years now. Um, and I'm honored to speak at this listening session. I appreciate uh, Director Sisma uh, for organizing it and also for inviting uh, me to, to speak here. Too few American workers are being heard in the halls of power in Congress or the executive branch. So I hope this is just the beginning where American workers can actually speak out as well as guest workers about how the program works in practice. There's clear evidence that the H-1B and other skilled guest worker programs are not meeting their intended goals. Up here on the slides, I don't know if the listeners can see the slides or not, but up on the slide here, I'm just showing some excerpts of, of various different articles uh, from the LA Times, from the New York Times, from Mother Jones, describing in a lot of detail how the program actually operates in practice. The programs have been widely abused and exploited, harming not just American workers, but also the foreign workers holding those visas. While some of these abuses have been reported in the media, many more have never been disclosed. The programs are supposed to fill worker shortages in the American labor market. Instead, they are mostly used for cheaper indentured labor, resulting in a distortion rather than an improvement of the labor and educational markets. Well-documented shortcomings in program design and implementation not only enables but actually invites employers to exploit the program for cheap labor. Most of the top H-1B and L-1 employers have built their businesses around these guest worker programs. They're not in the IT business. They are in the H-1B business. And it, is, and it is an extremely profitable business. During his campaign in 2016, President Trump recognized these problems and proposed fixes. In his first public statement as president-elect, Mr. Trump stated that ending visa abuse would be a priority in his first 100 days in office. On April 18th, two years ago, 2017, 
he signed the Buy American, Hire American executive order, which called for three principal actions on guest worker programs. First, to rigorously enforce and administer the laws governing the entry into the United States of workers from abroad. Second, calling on the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Labor, and the Secretary of Homeland Security to propose new rules and issue new guidance to protect the interests of United States workers in the administration of our, our immigration system, including the prevention of fraud or abuse. And third, to promote the proper functioning of the H-1B visa program, calling on those agencies to suggest reforms to help ensure that H-1B visas are awarded to the most skilled and highest paid petition beneficiaries. And anybody who's tooled around in any of the data know that in fact we're not getting the highest paid, we're not getting the most skilled out of the pool of candidates either in the H-1Bs or in the L-1s or OBTs. The Baja Executive Order is the first policy directive to fix, oriented towards fixing the H-1B and other guest worker visas in more than 20 years. It's worth highlighting that Congress has repeatedly turned a blind eye to the well-documented abuse of these programs. USCIS has taken several steps to meet the Baja Executive Order. These include increased transparency of which employers are using the programs and how they are using it, including gender as with was mentioned earlier, a change in the allocation of H-1B visas, increasing the odds that those uh, applicants with an advanced degree from a U.S. university will receive a visa, visible efforts to increase reporting of visa fraud. Anybody on Twitter sees those uh, calls for visa fraud reporting, increased scrutiny about the visa applications. We saw something about the RFEs earlier, improved definitions on the L-1B specialized knowledge and requiring greater details and documentation when employers place visa workers at third-party clients. And we saw both labor as well as USCIS talking about that, where there's a placement or outsourcing of workers, basically reselling labor. All of these are positive steps and are welcome. However positive these steps are, though, they only improve the programs on the margin. These are only marginal improvements on the programs. They do not fulfill AHA, the Baha Executive Order's goals of ensuring that the visas are awarded to the most skilled or highest paid be be petition beneficiaries, and they do not protect the interests of the, uni of the United States workers. So let me just highlight a couple of uh, examples of this. Um, much more can and should be done by the administration to improve the quality and skill level of the pool of H-1B workers to ensure that they are paid market wages and to protect the interests of U.S. workers. Such reforms will not only help U.S. workers, it will have positive benefits on students, sending them the proper market signals that these are good professions to go into, to the economy because we'll be getting better qualified, better skilled, higher paid foreign workers who are, better, who are contributing to the economy, and it will help those foreign workers, those guest workers themselves. Um, so first, uh, and I think most important, the Department of Labor should change how it calculates the prevailing wages. It should increase them significantly so they reflect true market wages. This was the intent of the law. Prevailing wage is a term of art. The intent was to meet market wages. DOL currently sets the prevailing wages far below market wages. In recent years, four and five H-1B workers come in on level one, levels one and two prevailing wages, which are roughly 20 to 40 percent below the average wage uh, for American workers. DOL can and should raise these prevailing wages to at least the average wage. And I, on the slide here, I've just given you an example. The most common H-1B uh, occupation is computer systems analyst. If I wanted to, as an employer, I could bring in a, in a computer systems analyst. This is somebody who works in the back office of an IT operation for $32,000 a year. I don't think anybody here thinks that's a market wage, but that's the legal wage that DOL has chosen to select. Second, the DOL should make the labor condition application, uh, ETA form 9035, much more meaningful. The LCA, labor condition application, is the principal method for protecting both U.S. workers and guest workers, but DOL has rendered it's basically meaningless, toothless by its implementations. The D 
DOL's own inspector general called the LCA and the way it's being implemented by DOL a rubber stamp. They use that quote. Uh, it's a rubber stamp. In other words, it doesn't do anything. The DOL should be investigating whether H-1B employers are meeting their actual wage and working condition attestations and enforce those rules. There, are, there have been tens of millions of LCA workers, H-1B workers on LCAs approved over the last 30 years of the program, yet there's never been an investigation of the actual wage and actual working conditions attestation, and every single employer signs that. That's not just the H-1B dependent firms. DOL should apply the actual wage and working condition rules to include employers that use contractor firms. There's nothing that stops them from applying it to third-party sites to use contractor firms to skirt those rules. This would close a loophole that allowed Disney to replace its U.S. workers with H-1Bs through outsourcing firm uh, Cognizant. Use that actual working condition wages attestation. The DOL should investigate and enforce the H-1B dependent rules of good faith recruiting and non-displacement. It's evident that those particular firms are simply paying lip service to the letter and spirit of these important labor protections. Let me also say we heard about the statutory limitations uh, that are contained in the, uh, the laws and rules. There are also statutory authorities that the Secretary of Labor has uh, to do investigations that the Secretary of Labor has chosen not to exercise. So they have much more authority than they've been exercising in terms of doing investigations and doing something about this. Third, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, OFCCP, should audit federal contractors to ensure that employers are not preferring H-1B workers over U.S. citizens and permanent residents. The OFCCP, which is a part of the Department of Labor, recently alleged that Oracle demonstrated, that's Oracle, the major Silicon Valley software firm, demonstrated, quote, in their, quote, extreme preference for employing visa holders uh, and it resulted in harming women and minorities. Uh, OFCCP should be auditing other federal contractors to ensure that they do not exhibit similar employment practices. Fourth, the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, should be investigating firms that are H-1B dependent to ensure that these employers are not discriminating. It's incredible that you could have a firm that has 30,000 workers in the U.S., and more than half of them are guest workers. It's just not feasible, it's not plausible that they're giving a fair shake and that they're not preferring guest workers. USCIS should be making more detailed uh, data available. Uh, we, we saw something on the employer data hub, but there's a lot more uh, that should be released in terms of the micro data so we can do a detailed uh, analysis, as well as with the L1, it's a little confusing the way that they've released the data. DHS should rescind the OPT STEM extension program. The program is based on a fallacious justification that international students somehow need three years of internships to complete their educational experience. As an educator, as a professor, I find that offensive. Uh, no educator at any reputable university would make such an argument that you get your degree, but you're not capable of going out and working as a professional. You need to be a need three additional years as an intern before you're qualified. The State Department should end the B-1 in lieu of H-1B program. The Department of Justice should investigate the employment practices of large H-1B employers. Uh, it's pretty clear that those firms demonstrate a hiring preference for guest workers. You can just look at the outcomes. Uh, it's obvious from the employer data hub from their own SEC filings by these firms. And lastly, um, and importantly, the USCIS should allocate visas based on the highest wages. That would meet, in fact, the quote that comes directly from Baja. The administration should be commended for its efforts, but much more needs to be done to fulfill the Baja order. In addition to administrative reforms I highlighted above, the administration should be pressing Congress using its efforts and its knowledge and capabilities from all the branches to be pressing Congress to reform the visa programs in addition to its own work. What we see in terms of these headlines, we don't, we're not seeing as many headlines nowadays, but that's not because people 
aren't training their replacements and firms are not bringing in cheap labor. They, in fact, are. It's just newspapers will not report the same story over and over again. So we need to start to act on these things. There's a lot of abuse that's still going on in spite of the commendable efforts that have been made so far. So thank you, thank you again for uh, the time here. Look forward to the rest of the session. Thank you, Professor Hira. Um, our last speaker during the listening session and before we open it up to feedback from our audience is Sarah Blackwell from the Blackwell Firm. Ms. Blackwell is President and CEO of Protect U.S. Workers and a human rights activist fighting for Americans and foreigners who have, are being mistreated by U.S. business owners and the U.S. government. Thank you, Ms. Blackwell, for your remarks. Thank you for having me. I am honored to be able to sit with a panel like this of really intelligent and successful people. Um, I have really appreciated all the comments and all of the efforts that are being made. Um, today, the issue is how the USCIS or how um, the executive branch can strengthen protections for the U.S. and the effect the effectiveness of the Baja executive order two years ago, which is now the two-year anniversary. Um, personally, I hear from U.S. citizens, um, foreign-born U.S. citizens, uh, foreigners here on visas, and people in other countries by the thousands on a very regular basis. So this is very uh, personal to me because if you don't think this is a problem, try listening to 500 people on a conference call who are telling you what you've been hearing every day for several years. I was um, happily oblivious to the fact that any of this is going on until I read Julia Preston's article in the New York Times and got involved with the Disney case. I was so shocked that that had happened and thought it was a slam dunk case of discrimination. And I was sad to learn that 250 Americans being fired and forced to train their um, replacement was really a small number that had been going on forever, it's going on all over the country, and that it has, there's, there's, it's not stopping anytime soon. I think it's important that when we um, judge, and, and when we're judging what's going on with the Baja and the effectiveness, that we remember separation of powers. Um, the executive branch can only enforce the laws. Congress is the one who has to change the laws. And um, the Supreme Court is the one that interprets the law. So it's important that when people are complaining, are calling or tweeting, um, that they remember that there's only so much that the USCIS, DOL, and DOJ can do. There's only so much in the parameters of what they're able to do. It is important also that the USCIS and the executive branch enforce the laws uh, fairly strictly and consistently. Um, they don't get to pick and choose. And I think that there's a lot of going on of enforcement of the laws that haven't been enforced in years. And I am very grateful that those laws are now being enforced. I think it's also important that we remember that the DOJ, DOL, the USCIS, uh, they have limited resources, money, tools, and people. So I think when we are judging where we are with immigration that we remember that the panel here um, does have limitations. I think there has been a lot done since the Baja uh, order, uh, the increase in RFEs. I think that's incredible. It shows that they're actually um, enforcing the laws where they weren't being enforced before. The reason why there's such an increase is because they weren't being enforced before. Uh, I think that people who come here on visas and they, the employer is trying to do the right thing and the employee is a valid uh, visa holder who qualifies and, and it's not a cheap labor try to 
take away American jobs, not that they're doing it, but the companies are doing it. Um, they are the ones that suffer as well. Um, their reputation suffers. Um, they're always looked at as, oh, you're an H-1B, so you must be one of those cheap laborers. Um, also, um, statistically speaking, if a company is applying for a 1,000 H-1Bs because they use them as cheap labor versus a company that really needs someone and they're only applying for two or three, statistically speaking, the real ones that uh, the real situations that we want aren't happening. Um, there are a lot of ways that it can be improved within the parameters of the executive branch. We need much more transparency. I'm grateful for uh, the new hub, the H-1B hub. Um, I think when we're looking at H-1B, uh, we looked at new uh, applications. We looked at continuing applications, but we didn't look at the the foreigners that are still here after their continued application, there is one renewal, it's three years, and then it's a renewal of another three years. But then if they have a sponsoring company, they get to stay here till they get a green card or until they go home and they're here for years. And if it's no secret that, the, um, that it keeps them in a position of exploitation, um, that they could be used uh, by these companies as cheap labor as they stay in that in that position, and it's no secret that there are uh, way more Indians in that position uh, than any other country. In fact, that's um, a huge issue in Congress. Um, I think that if we really care, we need to look at all business uh, visas. I think we need to know what are where are the L visas? How many? What are the rules? What? Who are the employers? Where are they? Because L visas are such a secret. Like, we don't know. I want to know about O visas. I want to know where these OPT workers are. And if we're going to have transparency, we are really limiting ourselves by keeping it with just H-1B. I think that that's very um, naive of us. Um, I think... We need more education of America. The media doesn't really care. Um, I think there's so many people, even people who are victims of it, will call me and say, I was just told that I have to leave my, like I'm being fired, I have to train my replacement. And I was reading and I saw on Disney that that happened there. I can't believe that that happened to them too. And I'm like, oh my God, you're like one of a thousand people who've contacted me today, just today. People in the situation don't even realize how prevalent this is and how important this is. And I think we've really got to find tools through the executive orders and through um, any way that we can get out the education of what is really happening in America. Um, I'm very grateful for this event and um, for other events that um, Director Cisna has, has participated in. I think that uh, there is, when you get a work visa, you're here as a non-immigrant, not as an immigrant. Um, when you're here as an OPT student, you're a non-immigrant, you're, you're not an immigrant. So if you're signing something saying that you don't intend to stay in the United States because you're a non-immigrant and you do intend, I think we should be prosecuting those people. And that would change a lot of, of these situations. Um, I don't agree with returning money to petitioners when they don't get granted the visa. It's like playing the lottery and then if you lose, you get your money back. I think that will help um, keep, uh, that will raise money for the government and enforcement and it will have a lot of other benefits. I think we need to find a way to track captive workforces. Those are the people who are working for American employers but are overseas. It's part of the business model. It's part of the H-1B issue. Um, and I think that if we ignore that part of it, uh, that's the end game. I mean, the cost savings is really when you can send it off to India um, and pay someone $9,000 a year for what you were paying an American $100,000 a year to do. Um, the business model basically um, is changes. It's not always the same. Sometimes, like IBM, Verizon, they do it themselves. But a lot of times, these 
Indian-based contracting companies, like with Disney, they contract with them. The Americans are forced to train them, but they're also training people overseas at the same time. The end game is to offshore the jobs to India, and then those H-1B people are moved to a different location. Um, this is, because it's part of the business model, should be considered when we're talking about um, buy American, hire American. Um, and I, I think the security risks are not even being looked at at all, um, in addition to the fact that we are allowing our American companies exploit foreigners as slaves in foreign countries, and because they're not on our soil, we're doing nothing about it. Um, I, I agree with um, Mr. Professor Hira, uh, always in everything he does because he's brilliant. But as the Department of Labor needs to revisit the prevailing wage um, of all of the jobs. I think that will really help combat a lot of these issues. It will it will force companies that when they bring in the H one B, they wouldn't be as much cheap labor. But my real purpose of having Department of Labor raise prevailing wage is because these greedy CEO billionaires who own these companies who are abusing the foreigners, using them as cheap labor, and also firing Americans um, with no regard of, of who, that they're real people, and they are making millions of dollars in bonuses. Um, they want this program to continue, so what they say is there's a labor shortage. There's, there's just not enough workers that, that we just we can't find the workers. And so I would, if I was Department of Labor, say, well, if we're without the workers, then that means we have a high demand and a low supply. And that means we have high wages because basic economics say that if there is a high demand and a low supply, you're going to have higher wages. So, yes, you're right, billionaires. So, therefore, our prevailing wage is going to go up even higher than, you know, what I would suggest, what Professor Hira or anybody would suggest. I think we should say, yes, we agree with you. So now $100,000, $150,000, since it's your call and you're the one saying that. Um, Department of Justice, um, my <laughs> Department of Justice has the ability to uh, go after companies who discriminate against citizenship. That is not in Title Seven. Title Seven is national origin and race, which is okay and it helps if it's against an American. But you can't say an American citizen because it's not covered under Title Seven. But it is um, under Eight USC thirteen twenty four B that the Department of Justice can do it. Um, the problem is the only way that the Department of Justice can can use that statute to enforce the laws is if you liter if the company literally says, I hate American citizens and I don't want them. There's no other situation that I have reported where they said it qualified. Um, I know um, that when the law was enacted, it was mainly for foreigners because certain companies didn't want to hire foreigners. Um, but right now, I think it's really important for the American people, and I think that we need to look at how we can protect American citizens. Um, I agree that OPT should not be three years. It's one year. Um, if people are, the purpose of OPT is to train, not to work, and I think that there should be um, a committee that goes, or a group that goes into these companies that are hiring these OPTs and saying, hmm, are you working or training? And if you're working, you're violation. And... I think they should be punished for it. Uh, the DOJ, DOL, DHS, and Congress, my, my suggestion is that they go in and they meet these people. Um, I think they should. It's no secret Verizon's going to fire a 1,000 people. I think that Congress and executive branch and the White House should just go to Verizon and meet these people, the, the actual people who are being fired, talk to them. If the American people and the foreigners are too scared to come out and talk. Otherwise, it would be 
it would be huge, huge rallies and protests and people all over, but they're terrified of being blackballed. If Congress showed up, if people showed up where there is training going on and said, I just want to see what's going on and talk to the people, the I think that they would care more about what's really going on. It's not just something that they hear about. It's something that they actually have to experience. And um, I personally can tell you it is life-changing. Um, if we have more efforts in detecting fraud for H-1B, that will help legitimize uh and get qualified H-1B workers, um, and the less fraud we have, less, less exploitation, and that really helps American workers because um, Americans are trying to compete against foreigners who are being exploited, and so they are having to work 15-hour jobs, uh, 15 hours a day, seven days a week, because that's what their counterparts who are on visas are doing, and they're only doing it because uh, they're in a position to be exploited. Uh, so it directly assist and helps American workers as well. Americans need to be the priority in America, and I think foreigners need to be the priority in their country. However, we are all humans and deserve the basic human rights, and I think that this immigration system should uh, respect that, but also remember that in America, Americans take priority. Um, if I had to give a grade to the effectiveness of Baja, I would give it a D minus at best. Um, my opinion, though, is that the fault lies with the White House administration and Congress. I can say that there are very few people who actually understand this business model. Um, there's very few people, um, in, in politicians or people in the government who understand it. Honestly, if you talk to people, they have no idea. Um, the ones who do know are bought or owned um, by these big companies that benefit. Of the super few left in the government, um, or people who are affected by it, they are afraid to speak out. Um, and it is a huge task to do anything. Director Cisna is one of the few people who honestly understands all aspects of these complex and vital issues. He isn't bought. He can't be pushed into doing things that are not within his executive powers or his moral code. He actually cares about American workers. America and foreigners who actually qualify under the Im immigration laws. He cares about it. He works hard. Right after he was confirmed, his office contacted Protect U.S. workers, and, and he, Director Cisna explained that because Americans are the priority in America, he wanted to speak to workers that actually suffered from this. Unfortunately, not many people could show up because they are in such fear of being exposed. I think I speak on behalf of many of the American workers that put their trust in this White House administration to make changes. And we are very disappointed. We feel betrayed, and we don't think that people are really, the Congress or the White House really cares about this issue. And I will say that I think on behalf of most American workers that if anything um, if there's any disruption or removal of Cisna or Kathy Newball, that we will directly hold the White House administration responsible now and in 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those joining us in the room, we're ne we'd now like to open it up to um, hear your feedback on the topics we've covered this afternoon. I do have a few reminders again. Um, please limit your, feed uh, your feedback to today's topic, the Baja Executive Order. Um, also, due to time constraints, we kindly ask that you please only provide one comment at a time. 
uh, do not share case-specific information. Um, while we are here to listen to your valuable feedback, we will not respond to the comments at this time. After the listening session, we will share some specific ways you can continue to engage with us. Um, and I also ask that uh, when you make a comment, please identify yourself for the benefit of those who are joining us by phone today. So with that, um, I would like to open the floor. Sure, right here. Hi, my name is Bob Dane, Executive Director with FAIR. I guess this is a quick comment since you're not providing feedback, so it's not technically a question. Um, what I've heard is uh, admirable uh, progress towards satisfying the executive order, developing interagency coordination, collaboration, alliances, uh, memorandums of understanding, and so forth. Enforcement and penalties are very much a deterrent, but so too is the awareness by industry that there's new rules, new enforcement, fraud detection, a new sheriff in town. So it sure would be helpful um, if you have extra money to broadly utilize marketing advertising um, targeted towards industry, letting them know that there is a new era. Similarly, Sarah just reminded me of something with uh, the announcement last week that the unemployment rate is at a 49 and a year, 49 year and a half low and the economy soaring and jobs opening up, big business is continuing to use that as an opportunity to push for more guest workers. And I think it's uh, incumbent on your interagency collaboration to have a, a sustained high-profile marketing campaign to refute that. We've got to break the cycle. Otherwise, it's one step forward and one back. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Should we just go right down the line? Thank you. Uh, Mark Krikorian from the Center for Immigration Studies. I'd like to commend Director Sisna on his uh, vital and even irreplaceable role in defending American workers. A couple of suggestions I had specifically for, and after it goes around, I have other suggestions for others, but I would just underline Professor Hira's comments that um, when there's a, when there's, you know, an oversubscription of H-1B uh, petitions, instead of doing the lottery do essentially an auction. I mean, it would eliminate the whole prevailing wage issue because it would almost make it moot. Um, I know this is something probably that requires approval above your pay grade, but OPT has no reason to even exist. Uh, it, it sh I mean, it's, it's created by regulation. Um, it should just be abolished. And for, and this is a USCIS issue still, Mike, it'd be good to know and I probably would have to be an estimate, but an official estimate, how many H-1Bs are there at any one time? How many L-1s are there at any one time? I mean, in other words, a snapshot, and, you know, it would have, it would be an estimate, but it would be an informed estimate instead of our having to make up our own estimate. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Russ Harrison with IEEE USA. Uh, we represent uh, 180,000 technology workers in the United States, some of the largest representatives of technology workers in the country. Um, I first want to just thank all of you. Um, IEEE USA has been concerned about the H-1B since the mid-1990s, and for the bulk of that time, nobody cared. Uh, and so we are very grateful for all the work that you've done. and. Hopefully, we'll continue to do. Uh, agree with a lot of what Dr. Hira said. I think there is an awful lot more that can be done. Um, laws allow uh, a more aggressive uh, uh, efforts, although we do have to recognize, I think Ms. Conway said, that the, the law itself places some fairly severe constraints on what can be done. Um, I want to be a, a little bit of a contrarian um, based on what my, Dr. Hira and Mr. Krikorian just said. Um, IEEE USA believes that there is an important role that OPT has to play in our country. Um, this country graduates some astoundingly smart people from our graduate schools. And we believe it is in this country's interest if we can keep them. Right now, because of visa levels and all sorts of things, it's very hard to do. And we need some place for them to go after graduating while they wait to get a green card and therefore be can become an American citizen. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can do that through an H-1B, which is a bad idea. You can do it through an L, which is a bad idea. The OPT is problematic, but we believe it is the best option we have available to us. And so just raise the concern that getting rid of or dramatically cutting back the OPT process 
does also dramatically reduce our ability to capture the right people that come out of our universities, which is, would be a long-term problem for the country. Right. Uh, thank you very much for this listening session. This was great. My name is Kevin Lynn. I'm the Executive Director of Progressives for Immigration Reform. I'm also the founder of U.S. Tech Workers and Doctors Without Jobs. And I have a few statements, but since we're limited to just one, I'll go with the most granular one first. I really applaud the employment uh, data hub. I think it's fantastic. But one of the things that's not on there that we had been able to get from FOIA requests in the past is work site information. Now, this is important, uh, and I'm glad Robert Heath is in the room, too, because he's slung around a lot of LCA data over the last couple of years. Uh, for instance, if I were to search on, let's say, ABC company, I, they would come up and they might have five LCA applications. However, that's really not indicative of the number of H-1B visa holders working at that site. If you look at the worksite address, you will find dozens more. And I've done this with insurance companies, tech companies, automotive companies. Uh, because these other H-1B visa holders are actually employed by a third party, uh, emphasis, a tata, my old alumna, uh, my old alma, alma mater, uh, Ernst & Young, Capgemini. So we really do need that work site data uh, to be part of the data hub. Thank you. Thank you. I know we have some U.S. workers here. Um, would one of you go right ahead? Okay. My name is Hillary Gamm, and I'm here today to thank you first for giving us an opportunity to speak to you directly. Uh, the current administration speaks to big tech directly often, and hears directly from them, and hears their cries um, and the significant uh, continuation of the portrayal that there is not enough intelligent, educated, and able American workers, which is a myth. And their new myth that they're starting with is, is AI is going to take away all the jobs. AI is a job creator. It's not going to take away the jobs. And I'm here to tell you that over the past two weeks, since receiving this invitation, I've had hundreds of tech workers reach out to me. Uh, they are hoping that I have an opportunity to impart their thoughts and their ideas to you. I'm on the train on the way down here. I made a list of a dozen, only a dozen um, policy um, items. And if you'll indulge me, I just want to give you a little bit of information about me, who I am, um, and why I'm doing this, and why I'm here, and then just spend two minutes just going over so I have an opportunity to make sure I, I cover everything everyone's asked me to go over. I come from a family of engineers, uh, brothers who attended MIT. Interestingly, their sons were not accepted, although now one of their sons is being asked to go back and be a professor. Why is that, you might ask, and that is because today American children um, are really being forced out of the slots uh, to be educated in STEM. I 100% disagree with the comment just made about OPT, and I'm going to kick off with that because everyone that I know that's in tech will tell you that OPT is killing the pipeline of American children being able to be hired out of college. And the reason is because OPT offers every employer a 15% tax break. The employer does not have to pay taxes on that uh, OPT hire, and therefore the OPT foreign hire is more attractive than an American child coming out of the university. So when you have an American coming out of MIT or an American coming out of a state university, they're at a disadvantage. They're at a disadvantage to get full-time employment upon graduation, but they're also at a disadvantage when it comes to getting an internship uh, in the summertime. So 20 years ago, where we had this huge pipeline of American children, who are the children of engineers, uh, much like myself, would have opportunities to work in employers. Today, they're not being given those opportunities. And instead, OPTs are being given those opportunities. Once the OPT is in the door, they're able to work for three years. Once they're there for three years, what happens is, if they're unable to get that employer to get them hired on an H-1B, they can take another graduate class and extend it for five years. Let me tell you why that's a problem. It's a problem because the American who could potentially be interviewing for that very same job doesn't even get an opportunity to interview, sir. And the reason they don't even get a job opportunity to interview is because the foreign person who is on the OPT that is employed 
has such specific rem such specific specifications on their resume that when they create the H one B, there's no American that could possibly be able to have those same specifications on that resume. And so the Americans are completely locked out of the interview process and then the OPT is hired. And so that's a situation that's creating a additional abuse and fraud because the OPTs are taking the pipeline for engineers. I can tell you I have a son who's studying engineering today. The majority of those he's studying with are not from the United States. I come from a family that dedicated uh, life to service, so I so appreciate you listening to us today. So I'm here and I'm passionate about this because my father served the federal government for over 30 years. And when he retired, he was at the highest grade there was. And so I promised him on his deathbed that I would make sure that people in Washington understood that we are not setting up our country for success. We're not teaching our children. We're not hiring them. We're not giving them an opportunity to be educated. And we're not giving any opportunities for our American workers to be employed. On the train on the way here, I heard, because I'm still currently employed and I'm still working in the tech industry, 1,000 people that are in the tech department where I work, a company that is basically paid by the federal government because they are paid through um, government subsidies, they only serve American citizens, so they don't serve any foreign citizens. They've laid out 1,000 American workers in the past two weeks. They're opening a shop in India with 4,000 workers and a shop in the Philippines for 1,600 workers. So to Sarah's point that she made earlier, captive workforces are real. We started out with H-1Bs. We started out where we were training foreign replacements here on American soil. And today, American companies are sending their American workers to the Philippines, to China, to Costa Rica, to Mexico, to India, to Ireland, to Poland. And they're sending them there, and they're teaching their foreign replacements. The Americans are let go. And then... The entire organization of hundreds and sometimes over a thousand workers is being completely displaced by these foreign workforces. And it's happening over and over again. It is not getting media coverage, and American tech workers are silenced. We're silenced by the severance packages that have to be signed. So you have thousands and thousands at this point, over a million American workers who have lost their jobs and cannot speak out because they're hand tied by severance agreements. And I'll just make one more comment because I know that I can't take all the time because so many people want me to say so many things. I'm going to say one other thing. The reason H-1B started, guys, is because Microsoft was sued in 1990s. They were sued when American workers who were working as contractors wanted benefits. So what happened is that all these companies sprang up, and they were sued because if they worked over 12 months, right, then they were being sued because they weren't providing benefits because then they were true employees. So what happened? So what happened is the progression was all of these companies, it started out being American companies, like at the time Anderson, but now it's, you know, Accenture, Deloitte, Dell. It became Infosys, Tata, HCL. Those companies are able to hire people for more than 12 months. They're able to hire people for 36 months or five years or 10 years. And so that whole outsourcing model, instead of what it used to be, when Americans would go in and work as contractors and take jobs and stay there, they were basically pushed out of the workforce. So the American-centric labor, where Americans were recruited, Americans were hiring, and Americans had the relationships with the American employers, all disappeared when the companies were scared to be sued by their contract labor force. And then what happened was all of these outsources Outsourcers came into being, and they've now taken, made billions and billions of dollars. And not only does the local, state, and federal government hire H-1B workers, and if I'm not mistaken, I believe that there's H-1B workers even working for the Department of Labor today, based on the data that we reviewed. So understand that we need to hopefully, this is a policy thing, if we could maybe change the law to allow Americans to work as contractors to make Americans more attractive to American companies without necessarily potentially being penalized if they ha keep them on for more than 12 months, maybe more Americans could be hired directly and be more attractive to our American employers. And so if I have the chance to speak again, I have plenty more to say, but I see it. And, I, again, thank you all very much.
Thank you. Also, use this time to just remind everybody if you have additional comments or anything that you don't get to mention here, you are welcome to email us at public.engagement at uscis.dhs.gov. Um, go right ahead, sir. Hello, my name is Robert Heath, and I'd like to thank every one of you people on the panel. You're doing a great job. And yeah, but you can't see what's happening out in the field. We see it. Uh, my name is Robert Heath. I own the website uh, h1bfacts.com. I've download, downloaded the data from the Office of Foreign Labor Certification. Now, some of the data wasn't included, so I filed num numerous FOIA requests to get what Kevin Lynn mentioned, worksite address. And from that data, I can, I can locate a lot of workers, uh, a, a lot of workers that are displacing U.S. workers. Not only can I do it with the data, but I can see it in person. Now, my my per, my primary focus here is is two things: enforcement and transparency. And if you guys can tie off tie off of us, the, the U.S. worker, we can help you improve the job that you're doing. You made a, you made a great pitch of of. of Sarah and Ron, I, I really appreciate the, 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 your message. You gave a great message, and Ms., Mr. Sisna, I appreciate all the work that you're doing. If you, if you can just leverage off of us, if, you, if we can get more transparency, we can help you do your job, do a better job. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Go right ahead. And I really didn't even know what I was going to say. Here. But I want to I want to thank everybody. First of all, thank everybody on the panel. I was an American worker who was forced to train my foreign placement a couple of years ago. They marched in people on H-1B visas, mostly male Indians under the age of thirty. There was a couple hundred of us that had to train our foreign placements. It was the most horrific thing. Anybody should have to go through. It's an assault on America, on its values. We were silenced by a severance agreement that I had to sign, which I signed it. I signed it because the people that were laid up before me weren't finding jobs. And I was afraid that I might lose my house if I didn't sign it. And, and you know, I'd have somebody to get me through to another job. There is such a disconnect between what's going on out there and the United States government. It's not even funny. That was two years ago. Since that time, not one member of Congress has come to defense of Americans training their foreign placement. Not one media would pick the story up. Me and Sarah went around, went to protests in New York, Chicago, all over the country. When we heard people train the foreign place, we went on 60 Minutes, and that aired twice last year. And still, there's not one law that's been written to protect Americans training the foreign place. But, you know, I come from a military family, too. And my forefathers fought in different countries to prevent what's going on in the country today. And there's such a disconnect. And I had to sit there and train a non-citizen to the United States, my job, over a period of three months. And they weren't that good, so they had to bring in a whole other group, and we had to train them for three months. You know what that does to you? And yet there's a disconnect, and we sit year after year, you know, listening to, to these conversations and, and slides, and, and it's not the truth. We, America is in a crisis right now because the, the, the information I had to turn over to people that were non-citizens was very sensitive customer information, HR information, social security numbers, people's salaries to foreigners. All of that information is going to a different country. All of our technical skills are being taught to a different country. And nobody is reporting on this. 
Nobody is seriously looking at the huge national security risk we have in this country. Right now, I have a job with, with, with the government, and I'm watching all of our sensitive information being offshore to India through various consulting. People, me and Sarah talk to people weekly. We have weekly conferences with people across the country that can't find work, that are programmers, that can't find a job. I know somebody out in California that wrote Oracle books that had couldn't find a job for two years. We are not, this is not, this should not be a slideshow presentation of what we should do wrong or right. We're in a crisis in this country. And so we start turning around, we're, we're in a lot of trouble. And, and um, I just want to say that, that, you know, we met with Francis Sister about a year ago down in Florida. And I love what he's doing. And I love his heart. And I know his heart's in the right place. And we, we respect so much the job that you're doing. It's unbelievable. I know you're trying. I know you understand because Francis Sister was also in technology before, you know, went to the USA. So I know he understands and we talk for hours about what's going on. We'd like to help you, you know, bring you closer to what's really going on out there. And um, we'd like to continue working, and thank you so much for, for having us here. And we're, you know, whenever you have to talk to us, you know, pick up the phone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Jay Palmer. I'm a whistleblower and um, a consultant. Uh, first off, I fight for the rights of the American worker being laid off. Second of all, the H-1Bs that come over that are being mistreated, bought and sold, and human trafficking also fight for their rights as well because they're human beings. Um, say a couple things. Really want to speak to Ms. Conway, uh, Ms. Thomas, uh, Mr. Sonderling, if I said that right. But before that, Director, thank you for the access to people like Andrew Davidson, Jacob, and Dr. Hira, thank you for your support. You know, for us to really stop this fraud, we have to, and I'm speaking to Ms. Conway and you all first, we have to align the people that I talk to in the field, the agents that are working these cases. A lot of the AUSAs are not trained to handle these cases. They don't even know what H-1B fraud is. They read the policy. They can't interpret it. Agents are having to prove the cases and then take them to an AUSA, hope that they will prosecute them. Sometimes the lag is three to six months. The people have closed up shop with the fraud and moved on. Um, when it comes to DL, DOL, I think y'all mentioned y'all had, y'all had 900 something cases last year. I think it was something like that. I currently have 1,400 names of people that haven't been paid in six months that have come to me through website or just reach out to me daily, just like Sarah. It's, it's horrific of what these people go through. Um, they're living in guest houses. Um, they're paying for their visas. Um, and I do feel like um, we are making some difference, you know, through Director Sisson and his staff, who's just been great. The tips they take, they're following up on them. But these people are displacing Americans, and then they're not getting paid. It's not even close that they're not getting paid. I had two sample cases last, last six months using TVPA in the forced labor section. They both settled within four weeks because they're all cheating. And, you know, we're trying to stop that and put Americans back to work. Some of the people that have come forward, they get threatened. They get blackballed. One of the cases, the gentleman's family got threatened in India. I get death threats, Sarah gets them. But we're trying to help. The alignment between these agencies and not to work in the silo is very important. But I'm going to leave you with a story about Nandini who contacted me. Nandini came over, um, 11 years of experience on an H-1B. She came over to create jobs. She got bought and sold to several body shops. Nandini could not find her own work. Nandini was having, was being raped by her manager in order to pay her rent. That is just a classic, classic example of what happens in this H-1B world. This is not the exception. This is the rule. I wish I could paint a better picture, but this is what I hear every single day of my life. So I commend you what you're doing. Um, it's amazing.
rising and help me help these people. Some of the people that have been awarded green cards that are former H-1Bs are now being fired because they won't work 80 and 90 hours a week. And I'm speaking to you, Salil, who's been texting me, who's listening. The audience for this is, is amazing for the people that are listening to this right now. You know, we, y'all are empowered, and we will support you. Help us help them. Help us help the Americans. Help us help the people that come over here fighting for the American dream. That's all we ask. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have additional comments? Very um, happy when uh, the current administration signed in the president executive order to buy American hair making. We were all thrilled. Um, on a scale of one to ten, I, I don't think I could probably rate you more than probably a two or three. Um, but that means there's a lot of opportunity for improvement, which is great. Uh, the, ex the, the intent, as I read it, which is it's right here, the document, I made sure I reviewed it in detail, was uh, economic and national security. So just as uh, Don referred to earlier, there's a serious national security risk. Because today we have healthcare companies. So HIPAA, HIPAA laws uh, are signed in the U.S. when uh, tech workers and all workers work with uh, personal U.S. citizen health information. When the healthcare companies in the United States send the jobs and the data overseas, the HIPAA laws really can't be enforced. So I think that's something that you guys could potentially look at. Financial services companies um, that hold our uh, retirement information, our retirement data, so security data, uh, all that information, again, stored overseas. So when the data is stored physically in the U.S., we can protect it physically. When the data is allowed to flow freely across country lines, we can't protect it. So if, let's say, Pakistan decides to bomb India and take out a data storage facility, we could potentially have our electric grid go down, uh, and we could potentially have uh, people unable to access their bank records or their health records. So those things are important. So one of the policy suggestions I have is that potentially the U.S. could pass some data must stay laws the same way that the EU has, the same way Australia has, the same way China has, and the same way India has. So data must stay laws would give us a lot more uh, security in terms of national security. To Ron Harris' point earlier, Professor Hira uh, walked me through, and I looked up the prevailing wage for my job in uh, the town closest to me. Uh, the prevailing wage for um, this particular job, 15-1199, is $24.99 an hour, actually twenty four eleven. Uh, that's for Stamford, Connecticut. People who clean toilets make $25 an hour in Stamford, Connecticut. So I'm not sure that that's the right wage. I would uh, strongly suggest the suggestions made by those you've heard today uh, requesting that you look at a prevailing wage that's much more in line with what Americans should be making uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, the next thing I just want to mention is uh, the order was to strengthen our middle class um, we have U.S. workers who are retraining their uh, foreign replacements. The TAA website lists in detail, uh, and it's very easily for any of you to look up because I'm able to look it up, what companies have workers that are applying for their TAA, their training. It tells you exactly those workers and what companies they're at. It specifically will tell you how many people they trained and if they trained them overseas or if they trained them here in the U.S. What's happening many times is those workers who are educated Americans who are holding good paying jobs and then losing their jobs are then moving into jobs that are actually uh, less, less skilled. And what happens then when you, when you have that less skilled worker uh, and their job is being taken by more skilled or highly educated people, you're actually causing a problem where rather than people moving up into the middle class, People from the middle class are putting pressure on the lower classes and the lower wage earners, and that's happening today. Uh, we were just on a call recently where we heard about people who are former programmers going into landscaping because that's the only thing that they could do. Um, one of the things uh, I just wanted to mention in terms of the industries. So we hear a lot about big tech, um, and, and one of the because the data is available, because you've made the data available, we have uh, tech workers in Silicon Valley who've been laid off for Python, Python uh, coders. And when they look at the data that you've provided, although 
the media has purported that the H-1Bs have actually gone down and this and that, what we've seen when we analyze the data is that the H-1Bs are just moving. They're moving from outsourced companies to big tech. So when you look at Google, Amazon, um, and all the big tech companies out of Silicon Valley, they're getting 100% 100 approvals for all their H-1Bs, and all of those H-1Bs primarily are coming from uh, companies that uh, we're sending them labor, like from the outsourcers. So that's important. I just wanted to make sure I mention that. Um, I want to also mention, just to build on what they said before, so civil, civil rights are being violated. Um, we just heard from Jay Paul. So today what happens when Americans try to let people know what's going on, they get physically threatened, uh, they get intimidated. Uh, I use a pen name because I, um, I, I fear for my life for coming here and, and talking to you and talking to you all and for that of my family. That's how serious this is. Many, many people are making a lot of money by exploiting our system. We're counting on you all to continue to do the good work you're doing, but hopefully make things a little better. Um, today, the recruiters for uh, technology jobs are more than 90% from India. So Americans just don't have much of a chance to get the jobs. Uh, they have a hard time uh, being recruited. And uh, there's a lot of exploitation that goes along with the fact that that whole resource type of technology workers has been choked down. Um, and we just don't see uh, people that are American in positions to hire. Um, lastly, I just want to go through, because we have a couple, couple notes here. Um, Technology workers are now allowed to work remotely from all these foreign countries, yet American technology workers are being closed out of being allowed to work remotely. So in my, at my employer, uh, I have a family, I'm a mother, and fortunately for me, I was able to get a job working remotely, so I've been able to stay employed for uh, my entire career. But today, uh, American workers that are working remotely are being forced to come back into the office. And although I hear, and I just heard from someone on the train today, that uh, does a lot of government work, and he was talking to me about how hard it is to find workers in uh, the Alabama area. I said to him, when the government looks to hire people, do they ever consider hiring people to work remotely? Because I think if the government uh, was allowed to potentially hire Americans remotely, then we can employ a lot more Americans, and we wouldn't really see any situation where there weren't enough Americans to fill any tech jobs. Um, I would also just suggest that ageism is very serious. So we have all tech workers who are over the age of 40 who are discriminated against. And we once had a very diverse workforce. When I started out working, uh, women made up 35% of the tech jobs in the U.S. Today we hold less than 10%. American women hold less than 10% of the tech jobs in the U.S. American women hold jobs that typically get displaced by H-1B holders. So I don't want to say that American women are specifically targeted, but the jobs that we typically hold are the first ones. They're the low-hanging fruit. So what you see is American women and American minorities being displaced, and you see a very diverse workforce that once existed in tech, and now it's changed. And now it's monopolized by 90% or 95% of people who come from one country. And they are going into management and they're going into leadership positions. And they don't hire Americans. They don't consider promoting Americans. And so when we talk about women in STEM and the current administration and the cabinet talks about supporting women in STEM, we must recognize that when we push women out of American STEM jobs, by forcing them to work 60, 70, 80, or 90 hours a week to be on par with their foreign contemporaries, and we push them out of jobs, we're not going to encourage our daughters to go and study those things in college. We're not going to encourage them to take those jobs. And when we see Silicon Valley, Sheryl Sandberg, who talks about the need for uh, women to sit at the table, We've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of women holding senior leadership and executive positions across the board at American corporations, specifically in big tech. And that's because there's just not a lot of us left. So we don't have any critical mass. When we're not creating an environment to hire and maintain a, a job for American women, we're not able to promote them and we're not able to give them leadership positions. So the last thing I'll say is, H4EAD directly affects American women. 
directly affects our ability to compete for jobs. H-4 EADs can work anywhere. They can take any job. They can take multiple jobs. We have stories where we have people who are in H-1Bs, and they're also working a second job. Um, they're working as H-4 EADs. Their spouse is an H-1B. They work one full-time job. They have a second laptop on their desk, and that second laptop is the second job that they hold where they're taking a percentage of the hourly wage and sending that job to India. Americans can't do that. Americans can't hold down two jobs at the same time. You know, we're, we, we hold down one job. So... In the words of my friend uh, Marie Larson, who's also fighting this fight, transparency and truth would generate order over the chaos today. We need to stop labeling high-skilled guest workers. We need to be saying they're just regular workers. Um, to the gentleman here on the panel who spoke earlier, uh, there is evidence and proof that the H-1Bs being hired today here in the United States are less qualified to do the jobs than American high school graduates less qualified than American high school graduates based on their understanding of uh, how the American society works, how business works, and their command of the English language. So we're taking Americans with college education, master's degrees, and years of professional experience. We're displacing them here in the U.S. with people who barely speak English on many times, who don't necessarily have the experience, don't understand our laws, don't understand the parameters. We're doing that here in the U.S. under H-1B, under L-1, under OPT, under H-4 EAD, and more importantly, because of H-1B, we have taken literally over a million U.S. jobs and put them over in another land. So in the same exact way that the American auto industry can't in innovate, right? It's really hard for us to make better automobiles if we're not manufacturing them here. If we continue to allow to our data to be somewhere else in other countries and we continue to allow those jobs to be in other countries, we hamper our ability to innovate. If we continue to not give our American children an opportunity to be educated in our educational systems and our best educational systems, then we are not going to have a pipeline of workers in the future. And the myth that was perpetuated for 25 years will become an actual reality. So, again, I just want to thank you all so, so much. For, I can't tell you how many calls I received. So grateful that you would listen to us today. My only hope is that the current administration will see fit to talk and bring in some of us U.S. tech workers, some of us U.S. STEM workers, and speak to us directly and give us just a fraction of the airtime they're giving the big tech corporate folks that are coming to Washington and talking about the need for, for immigrant labor. So thank you again. I just can't thank you enough. I just want you to know how sincere we are. Thank you. I think we have time for one last quick comment. Mr. Kokorian, you had your yeah, hand up. I, just a couple of small things. This is Mark Kokorian from the Center for Immigration Studies. I realize the statute doesn't allow you to prevent firms from replacing their American workers with H-1Bs, but is there wiggle room to, for reporting requirements? So that if they do that, they're required to report it because when you turn the lights on, the cockroaches are going to uh, run away. So that's one suggestion. I have no idea if that works or not. But And then a couple of things for Labor Department. It seems to me that one thing that would help is much more aggressive debarment. Um, you know, debarment now is, I mean, you know, there should be dozens and dozens and dozens of companies debarred for their conduct. And it just seems to me it's not being done aggressively enough. Also, in settlements with firms, this isn't directly on the um, directly on the work visa issue, but if there's a settlement for a violation of work visa rules, is it plausible to insert a e-verified use requirement as part of the settlement? Because ICE does that kind of thing frequently enough. I have no idea if it's permitted or not, but it might. And again, it. It's not work visas, but it does promote the higher American concept. And something that um, I have no idea how this would work, it's just an idea, is has the Labor Department investigated the idea, and this isn't an enforcement thing, this is maybe more for you, a domestic guest worker program um, uh, where you know a, a worker is brought for a seasonal job in a kind of organized, structured way, 
and then flown back, and there's rules for that. Um, and that would presumably not be the higher skilled ones, but the lower skilled H2Bs, that sort of thing. And the final point I'd like to make is I really hope, and this is obviously all beyond your uh, ken right now, but whatever White House proposal comes out on a broader immigration package, that it not involve increasing H-1B visas or just generally speaking increasing, um, you know, so-called high-skilled work visas, and I'm afraid that's very possible, uh, very possible it's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank all of you who are able to participate in today's listening session on the Baja Executive Order. Uh, we believe in transparency and equal access to the agency. To promote transparency, we maintain an electronic reading room where you can find information on a variety of topics. We also have a web page with numerous reports on data related to agency operations. We invite everyone to visit our website at uscis.gov to get additional information about our agency and its operations. Uh, you'll find a summary of today's listening session as well as the USCIS data presentation um, posted in the electronic reading room. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, should you have any additional feedback that you weren't able to make today, please email us at public.engagement at uscis.dhs.gov. And again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Please enjoy the rest of your day.